Hallelujah, glory to God. Okay, here we go. So we're just going to finish um, tribulation series that we've been going on for maybe like two weeks. And the last part we're looking at is they want a king, not God, right? And yesterday we looked at, this doesn't even have a lot to it. So at least that's what I think of you know, the most things. We've got to find out what he thinks first before I say anything. I retract my statement. So last night we were looking at Samuel 1, um, yesterday, sorry. Samuel 1, verse 8, right? Um, Samuel 1, chapter 8. Why am I? Ah. Here we go. They want a king, not God, and they shall have a king. All right, so they want they want someone to rule. Them, okay, they want to to have that that feeling like every nation has, but they don't want the holiness of God. So the leader that they they have or they they're going to have has to be a leader with a leader with less holiness than God. He has to allow homosexuality. He has to allow all the sins of the world. They want a leader, but they don't want God as the leader. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, it tells us that they complained against the man of God, right? They said he was too old. They said his sons had gone astray. They also said that they couldn't rule, so they demanded a king. Now, God, tell somebody, God hears everything. He's in all places at once, for all things at once, and he's just, he hears everything, okay? So we're looking at the last part of 1 Samuel 8. Where they murmured against God. They, these people like to murmur, they're stiff-necked, they're, they're never learning. Remember when Father said they murmured, um, they murmured at him in the wilderness? They, they murmured at him when he crossed them through the Red Sea? They murmured, man, they just murmured, they kept murmuring at him. Oh, we miss the meat and the onions and whatever we had in Egypt, and you brought us into the wilderness to starve. So at that point in time, their God was their belly. We're going there. Your God is your belly. Philippians 3.19. And it says, reading from verse 18 to 20. So we take it in context. And it says, For as I have often told you before, and now declare, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on, what's that word? Earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father told us several times that the things that we see are temporary, and the things that are unseen are eternal. Second Corinthians 4, verse 18, reading from... 17 to 19 and it says for our and temporary affliction is producing for us an eternal glory that far outweighs our troubles so we fix come in Bosh, she was here yeah she came into it well she she came sad she left smiling 
Oh, she come after four. No, after she came this morning, like eleven o'clock, then she passed back. Oh. Okay. For our light, Second Corinthians four eighteen. For our light and temporary affliction is producing for us an eternal glory that far outweighs our troubles. So whatever we fix our eyes on, which is, well, in heaven, whatever we fix our eyes in heaven, to the world it might seem like stupid, okay? It might ever be like, well, you know, you're missing out all the good things of the world and you're just... Um, you know, you're being stubborn, you're just doing your own holiness, whatever, you're missing out the fun, you're missing out the party. Um, tell somebody that when you party hard, <laughs> you can party so hard you don't expect a flood, and you party so hard you don't realize it's raining brimstone and fire until the brimstone falls. Right? The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be at the coming of the Son of Man. For they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, and they knew not until the flood came and swept them all away. All right. Um, give me a second. Okay, so Philippians 3.19, it tells us, well, our citizenship is in heaven. We are not identifying with a country. Okay, we're here to make a difference. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So in 1 Samuel 8, we see they want a king. But they don't want the king. They don't want Jesus. They want a king, a king that they can identify with in their sin. A king that says, okay, everybody can mar man can marry man and woman can marry woman. <laughs> a king that says, okay, you could commit abortion. A king that says, okay, if someone gouges out your eye, you could gouge out his eye. They want a king that is not holy. They do not want God. Because they rejected the King of Kings, that is Jesus Christ himself, they will get another king. They rejected the Prince of Peace, they will get another kind of peace. They rejected grace, and they will have punishment. Terrible on so many levels. Okay? So now, remember where we were reading yesterday, where he said, they who reject you have rejected me. And he told Samuel, he said, it's not you they're rejecting. It's me, God. All right. So this is where the world is at. Israel has been called as a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a chosen generation, all of that. All right. A people who's called out of darkness into his marvelous light that the earth can look to and see the great God of the universe, but Israel has fallen back. Now, we saw when Trump, President Trump, changed, um, let me change, he declared that thing and said, you know, Jerusalem has always been Israel's capital. Yeah, that's great, hallelujah. Now you know that Jerusalem belongs to Israel. Netanyahu came on and said, now Muslims can worship the way that they want. Jews can worship the way that they want. Christians can worship the way that they want. In essence now of them saying that, they've laid down a rule. They've declared something. They've said Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, the holy city of Jerusalem. And now they said, it doesn't matter how you worship there. So the world is looking at Jerusalem to see what they're doing now, as it is now the capital of Israel is being announced, and they are committing all sorts there. Not good. Okay? Now, remember when the Bible says they do abominations in a house called by my name to defile it? So too. 
They're doing abominations in the place that is called God to defile him. Israel is God's name and it is Israel's, God's name is Israel's banner. She is supposed to be bringing the world to God, but she's gone astray. She no longer wants to be the holy people alone. She wants to be one like the nations. She wants to see a king. She wants to see a king. To what? To see a king going in battle, just like how the United States has their armies. And they say, who is like the beast and who can make war with it? Just like Russia, just like Korea, just like China. She wants to be a part. The Bible says she's become like a harlot. God says he, de that he desires a divorce from her, to write a certificate of divorce. But he will not make a complete end of her. He will betroth her to her, to him again. Right. She wants to see a king in battle. God says, by faith he's well pleased, and without faith it is impossible to please him. So is he pleased right now? Is he pleased because they're asking for a, a what? A king. They're asking for a king to see. So they don't want to believe in a God they cannot see. It's like all over at Mount Sinai. Give us a God we can what? See. So what did they do? They made a golden cow, a calf. And they did what? They worshipped that. And then Moses came down with the, um, what you call it? What you call those things again? The commandments. <laughs> the commandments. <laughs> when Moses came down with the commandments, I'm like this. I'm like measuring. I don't know what to call it. When he came down with the commandments, and he saw that they did not desire to serve God, but they desired to serve something they could see, now, a stiff-necked people, a hardened people, they have turned away from the God who delivered them out of Egypt. They have turned away from the God who split open the Red Seas for them. They have turned away from God who was resurrected from the dead for them. They have turned away from God who dwelt with them as a pillar of fire and a cloud by day. They've turned away from God who has led them to victorious over their enemies. They've turned away from a God they cannot see and they desire a God they can see. So it mightn't be that everybody's pulling off earrings and bracelets and chains and saying, here, yeah, make a God. But in essence, they're doing the same thing because they reject the one they cannot see and they what? What are they doing? They're receiving the one they can see. That is why the Antichrist is coming. They want something they can see, not something they can't see. Jesus has not yet come. He's coming. When he comes, it's not going to be a secret event. It's going to be loud. It's going to be party in heaven. <laughs> the voice of the archangel, the trumpet sound. It's going to be an announcement. He's going to shout so hard the dead is going to wake up. Okay, it's not going to be quiet. Don't let anybody tell you that the day of the Lord has already come. I see that I have a doctrine preaching that last night. I stumbled upon it. That the day of the Lord has already come. Uh, hmm. yeah, yeah. I ain't receiving that for nothing. The day of the Lord has not come. Okay, listen. And a coven like how? Destruction for the wicked. Burning like an oven. Like fire and brimstone. Hello. All right. All right. So Israel desires a God they can see. So it's like being ungrateful all over again. Just like God brought them through the sea. And they're in a safe place. Away from whips cracking on their back. Away from... Away from, um, what you call this thing? Away from the taskmasters with, away from making bricks with their feet. 
that's what these can mix the mortar with stone and stone and clay with their feet imagine we have shovel and trowels they use their feet and they were given little portions of meals that they had to make do for the, the family and God set them free and they were so ungrateful that they turned around and they said when we were in Egypt we had fish and meat and onions and sive and celery and carrots and everything else and now you only given us this manna we, we, they didn't want the manna that was the bread of angels man you know you know if that fell from the sky today what would happen ay 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 that thing's going in a glass case nobody could touch it no that is manna from heaven they were fed with and god even said listen they looked at the bitter waters and god was trying to show them something you know you think god could not just rain down the sky fresh water from the sky and just giving them sweet rain water you think he could have when he brought them to a bitter part to show them that in their bitterness he was merciful to them and he made the water what he made their bitterness sweet he brought them out of slavery he freed them he gave them their own land again he was bringing them to the land of milk and honey but they started to murmur and the man of god got so frustrated that he cracked the rock he struck the rock without god saying to strike the rock so even the leader that god puts in place sometimes can get impatient Moses did that. Moses struck the rock and Moses didn't see the promised land because of it. Now, this is what Israel is doing. It's all over again. Can you see? Can you see how stiff-necked they've become? The leader of Israel, the Prime Minister, Netanyahu, he stood there and he, he sat there and he said, Muslims can worship the way that they want. Jews can worship the way that they want and Christians can worship the way that they want in the holy city in the holy land that was their perfect opportunity to say there is no other God but Israel the God of Israel there's no other God but Jesus Christ but they didn't do that they were ashamed of him that's horrible on so many levels that's horrible there was no there is no other God and they were ashamed to bear witness of him now they went through so much affliction okay just like you know the Bible says that when the angel of death was passing through Egypt he said every firstborn has to get under Oh. Uh, every firstborn, every yeah, every firstborn had to be under the blood of humans and beasts. Else the angel of death passed over and killed them. Okay? Now here's what God's saying. Every firstborn must be under the blood of who of jesus christ because he is that lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world and the bible says we are a kind of first fruits unto god through christ jesus every firstborn must be under the blood of christ he said if you are ashamed of me then i will be ashamed of you when we don't receive the blood as the saving grace of God when we don't receive the love of God through Jesus Christ as he expressed himself 
when we do not receive the love of the Savior and the sacrifice of Christ, we have set ourselves up We have set ourselves up for destruction. Israel carries the name of God and they deny that Jesus is God. We say it all the time, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord, He is one. The Lord is our God. Yet they say Allah is God. Yet they say whoever is God. Yet they say they say Jesus Christ is not God. Because if he's God, if they have to admit that, then there's only one way to him. And isn't it making sense that only God could appease his own anger? Isn't it making sense that only God could bring, could boil down his own anger? Only him could palcate his own anger. Only him could boil it down. Of course, he's the merciful God. He is the one who is yesterday, today, and forever. He is the unchanging I am that I am. But just like they did in Samuel, to Samuel, They've told off the people who've come preaching Christ. For the Bible says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Narrow and straight is the way that leads to heaven, and few there be that find it. Let's go scripture verse. Matthew seven fourteen. That's three sevens right there. Wow, check that out. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life. And only few find it. Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. What do they want to do? Eat the flock of God. That's what they want to do. That's their mission. Their mission is to convince people that salvation is found in other places but Jesus. Their mission is to mislead the flock out of the pasture of the good shepherd. And Jesus, didn't Jesus himself say, I am the gate? Remember when he said, I am the gate? And if anyone enters through any other way, he is a thief. Okay, John 10, 9. Reading from verse 8 to 10. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. Remember when he said, no one comes to the Father but through him? And no one comes to me unless the Father draws him near? The Father is the Holy Spirit. The Father is the Sovereign Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. And the Son is the flesh that is submitted to the Spirit of God only. No one can come to the Father unless through me. God is sovereign. God is holy. God is pure. How are you going to access the gift that is the Holy Spirit except through the blood of Christ? How are you going to... Um, how did he say it again? No one comes to me unless the Father draws him near. 
unless the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, begins to draw you unto Christ, how are you going to come? No, you're not going to come. If the love of the truth is not in you, you will not come. Holy Spirit. Second Thessalonians two, verse ten. And it says, The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power and sign and false wonder what will the treaty of peace be a false wonder of course and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing remember the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing first corinthians 1 18 reading from 17 to 19 says For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with eloquent words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Thank you, Father. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. All right. So we're looking here as well at, where are we? In First Corinthians, no, Second Thessalonians, okay? Second Thessalonians 2, verse 9 to 11. God bless you, Sister Joanne and Brother Ashley. The coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by working of Satan with every kind of power sign and false wonder and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing and it says even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are what perishing Second Corinthians 4, 3. And it says, It said, We have redoubled secret and shameful ways. We do not practice deceit, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by open proclamation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of god so who are, who who is the message appealing to the spirit man the mind of the spirit our conscience our conscience of what of being convicted of sin we are called to serve god we are called to be holy and the bible says that well let me just read it again Instead, we've renounced secrets and shameful ways because sin is hidden in the darkness and then the light comes. That's why they hate us. The light will expose. That's why we hate light when we're doing something wrong because the light exposes us. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not practice deceit, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by open proclamation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. The God of this age, who's running things? Satan with his system of money and evil, okay? The God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of christ who is the image of god now 
obviously. It's getting warm already. So the gospel is real to those who are perishing because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. And the God of this age is blinding the minds of the unbelievers. So that's the veil over their eyes. Like Saul, when he was persecuting the Christians, and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, Acts 9, 4, reading from verse 3. As Saul drew near to Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And verse 5, who are you, Lord? Saul asked, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. And reading verse 6. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Now remember, Saul was blind in a spiritual sense even though he could see. So if we read oh, just one more verse in, we'll see where he became blind. The men standing there with Saul stood speechless. They heard the voice but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see a thing. He was blind. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. All right. So he who had sight in his eyes became blind, because when he had sight in his eyes, he was spiritually blind. So sometimes God will take, he will allow Satan to afflict us, because we are too prideful in the thing that we have. So he'll take it away from us that we can appreciate the thing that we have when we, we get it back, when he gives it back to us, because he will give back soul to sight. The Bible goes on to tell us that Saul was put on a fast for three days and three nights, just like Jesus was in the belly of the earth, three days and three nights, just like Jonah was in the belly of the wheel, three days and three nights. He said, no sign shall be given except the sign of Jonah. That is the sign of repentance. You must come into knowing that Jesus is the Christ. There is no other way but him. God is our salvation. He is God. You must have the revelation. You must have the encounter with Christ. And then the graves will open up. And that thing that is holding you captive will loose in the mighty name of Jesus. Okay. So we're looking at... Where am I going with this? All oh, right. So, again, Saul learned. He learned through affliction who God is. He learned who Jesus was and is and is to come and forever will be. He learned by becoming blind because when he couldn't see, what did he have to do? He had to surrender. The spirit man had to surrender. Okay? The spirit man had to surrender. So that stubborn spirit was cast out with days of fasting and prayer. And God does nothing until he reveals it to his servant, the prophet. Of course. So God sent, um, what was this man's name? Ananias, if I'm not mistaken. Ananias, I think, his name was. Mm -hmm. I am not particularly sure. I can just go into the Bible and find out. Why am I doubting? I don't know. I think the guy's name was Ananias. Let me just go up there a little bit. Yes, his name was Ananias. Okay, so God told Ananias to go and meet this man called Saul. And Ananias was like, but he was killing thousands and thousands of Christians. He was, you know, um, you sure that's a good idea? And of course, Ananias got rebuked because he did not, he, he wanted to doubt God and then he came to senses and he was like, yes, Lord, right away. And, this, and in the meantime, Saul, who was blind, began to know the revelation of God and visions and revelations, well, how God reveals himself. 
And he, re he saw that he would meet a man called Ananias. So when Ananias came to Saul, it was fulfilled. And then scales fell from Saul's eyes. Why scales? Because those who can see in a physical sense but are blind in a spiritual sense, Satan has blinded the minds of them. Satan is what? A serpent. Very annoying serpent. A crushed head serpent. An annoying serpent. I don't like Satan. Okay. So, so scale fell from Saul's eyes, right? Something like scale, because that was the veil. So, whichever snake, it, of course it's Satan. Whenever that snake passed over your eyes to blind you from the light of Christ, let those scales fall right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Okay, those same scales that are on Saul's eyes are now on Israel's eyes because they're allowing every other God to be worshipped. And when you find Jesus in spirit and truth, when you find who he is, the God of Israel, you cannot turn away from him. You will serve nothing else. You will never go back to serving something else. Amen? Just give me a sec. The Holy Spirit is quickening me to get my... Um, just a sec. There's no shadow you light up. Mountains you won't climb up coming after me all right so thus says the spirit of the lord Saul receive your sight and Saul receive his sight he sent it through the word of his prophet now let me just just a second okay god is convicting me of something here so i just have to just do this right now There we go. I shall not die, but I shall live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen? All right. So Israel's got that same blind on. And why? They are consecrated people. Why would God allow this? So that we, who are on every other island and every other continent except Israel, can get a chance to be grafted in. That's what's going on right now. This is the fullness of the Gentiles, that it might come in. We who are not part of the olive tree have now been given a chance to be grafted in. Because Jesus didn't just die for Israel. He didn't just die for um, some. He died for all. Okay. So we've gone back on to the days of making a calf. They want to make a God to worship. They want to see something. So it's no wonder where the Bible says that they caused the image the image was given breath to speak. By who? The second beast. Or the first beast. Yes, no. We're going to go there right now. The image spoke. Not the image of God. We are not talking about the image of God. We're talking about the image of the beast. The second beast was permitted to give breath to the image of the first beast. So what does that mean? Oh, well, listen, it's a literal thing because it said it deceived. Okay, let's read Revelations 13, 15. Because of the signs it was given to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived those who dwelt on the earth, telling them to make an image to the beast. That had been wounded by the sword and yet had lived. The second beast was permitted to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image would also speak and cause all who refused to worship it to be killed. And the second beast required all people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Okay, 
So now let's wrap this up. So the blindness that they carried on with, whether they were at Mount Sinai, whether they were in the wilderness, whether wherever, wherever they were, wherever they were, they turned and they served other gods. They they started burning incense in the streets and worshipping the Queen of Heaven and making her cakes and it's terrible, 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 okay? They started mixing in with paganism, the ways of the devil, intertwined, not good. So Father is saying, even though they were blind, they will see, but that they will be blind now, that we could see and be grafted in. We would come to choose this, okay? The Bible tells us that. There is no other name on the heaven and earth by which we can be saved. All of the ground is sinking sand. I don't know if that's a Bible verse, but you know that song? Christ is the rock. Let me see if this is a all other ground. That might be a song. <laughs> it's a song. But it also tells us that Simon was she into Petros, which is sand that cannot hold anything to rock that can support everything okay upon this rock i'll build my church okay right so we're coming back to they want a king that they could see so they've gone back all into their ways of unbelief and isn't it a wonder that the end is revealed in the beginning and the beginning in the end i mean it's a sad thing but it is what it is. It's what's happening. And of course, they have started to set the stage for the Antichrist. The Antichrist is coming on the scene. And even so, the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. And the false prophet is being for set up. But he's already being glorified. Oh boy. So that he can usher in who? The Antichrist. Just like God sent his prophet and they stoned them. Now the Antichrist has sent his false prophets, and they received him. So what's going to happen? They're going to receive what they trust in. What they trust in is going to manifest. Oh, it's a sad day, but it is what it is. Now, God was very, very strict when he said, because it's not you, they've rejected. Remember when they said, Okay, just a second. The the your father's something's irritating my nose and just burning it and your father's rejected those um just like they rejected those before you just no your father's before you rejected the prophets I said, Acts seven fifty two. Now, if the if the spirit of prophecy is in you, then Jesus is in you because he is the spirit of of prophecy. He is the spirit of prophecy, and if Jesus is in you, then you're going to bear the spirit of truth because he is the spirit of truth. Those who abide in the lie cannot receive the truth. Just like they persecuted who? Your who? Your fathers. Your, the, um, sorry, just like your fathers persecuted the prophets and the ones who I sent before. In Acts 7, Acts 7, 52, reading from 51 to 53. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit just as your fathers did. Remember Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. If they reject you, they don't reject you, but they reject me and him who sent me. 
Which of the prophets did your fathers feel to persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. That is Jesus himself. And now you are his betrayers and murderers. You have received the law ordained by angels and you have not kept it. The first, the very first commandment God said was what? Let's go and find it. Commandment one. Serve no other God. Commandment one. I am the Lord your God. Here's how God says it. He said, this is what he calls us to remember. The end is revealed in the beginning and the beginning and the end. The same thing that they did in the beginning, they're doing now. They don't want a God they cannot see. No, they don't want Jesus. They want a God they can't see. They can't see. They don't want a king that they can't see. Jesus is the king of kings, lord of lords. No, they want a king they can't see. That's why when the Antichrist comes and they began, he begins to fool them with peace. And Jesus said, peace I give you. Not as the world gives you, but I give you. Do not suppose that I came to bring peace on the earth, but I came to bring what? A sword of division, dividing time, life from truth. My people, people of the devil. Is I the people of the devil on that side? My people on this side. Goat on this side, sheep on this side. Make up your mind. Choose this day whom you will serve. Exodus 20. Verse, Exodus 20, verse 2, the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The Bible says the soul that sins will surely what? Live? No, it will die because Satan has taken us under slavery of sin. He said, You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve sin and God. You can't serve money and God. You cannot serve God and Satan. You can't say hallelujah Jesus and be shaking the hands of the devil. It doesn't work like that. And he says, verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below you shall not bow down to them or worship them for i the lord your god am a jealous god punishing the children for the sins of the parents unto the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of them who love me and keep my commandments so Israel has gone astray. Instead of showing the world that the one true living God is Jesus Christ, that he is Yahweh, I am that I am, and he's Savior. There's no creator and there's no Savior besides Jesus. Instead of rising up to show the world that there's nothing else, they said Jews can worship the way that they want, Christians can worship the way that they want, Muslims can worship the way that they want, in the holy land what do you call that god calls that being ashamed okay so he said very well you don't want me as king you don't want whom i have ordained you don't want me as god you will have your god you will have your king and when he plunders you because Satan comes to lie, steal, kill, and destroy. When he comes to plunder you, he takes your daughters and your sons and your vineyards and your asses and your servants and he gives them away. Don't come crying to me because in that day I will not hear you. You want a king? Have a king. It will not be the King of Kings or the Lord of Lords. It will be the Antichrist. 
you want a king that you could see? He will sit in the palace and he will exalt himself above me and you will worship him and he will bring you down to nothing because Satan hates every single human being that is made in the image of God and once the spirit of truth is inside, that's double hatred. They want a king, they shall have a king. And so this is the sad story that they have rejected Jesus as the one true God. And they make place for the Antichrist. They make room for the Antichrist. And they shall have what they desire. Because God is a gentleman. He doesn't force. But when he's ready to rebuke, and when he can no longer take the affliction of his people, when he thinks they've learned their lesson, he will open their eyes just like Saul, when the scales fell off his eyes and he saw, scales will fall off their eyes and he they will see. You want to come in? Is there sitting there? Push the gate. And you could gently take all that chain there. The Bible says that he will what? He will what? Yeah, yeah, he gets it. All right. The Bible says he will sit. He will sit in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Okay. Yeah, I done. I done. He will sit in the temple, proclaiming himself to be God, but God will only take so much as He can take. Amen. The dispensation of grace is, is coming to an end. The prayers of the saints have reached up into the nostrils of God and it is sweet. Because they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We serve a just God, a righteous God. But what's happening? They're not serving the just and righteous God, the world. So God is going to take the prayer of the saints that is in the censer and pour his wrath in and fling it to the earth. That is exactly what he's going to do. <laughs> so that's this year. Look. Say hi. Hi. Yeah, he got He's going to fling it to the earth because that's exactly what the angel did. He didn't say anything. He flung the censer to the earth, mixed with what? Fire and blood. Bad. It's bad. It's bad. Okay. So, beloved, they want a king, they shall have a king. The world doesn't want Christ. Christ is coming. He's coming. But that the truth might be revealed, first the lie is shown. Let the light come. Okay, the darkness in the beginning. Remember what happened in the beginning? It was dark until God said, let there be light. And there was light. Amen? Just like that. Now the darkness must come. The midnight hour. And while the smart, the smart ones in Christ are filling up their lamps and keeping that flame lighting so that in the midnight hour, it doesn't go out and they could see where Jesus is, where the bridegroom is. They know the path because the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my, my what? My path. The world is wandering in darkness and tripping over themselves. They're stumbling because they don't have the light of the world. That is Jesus Christ. They don't. So they want a king. They shall have a king. But our king is Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty, the Lord strong and mighty in battle, our Savior, a deliverer, a king, a friend, a six closer than a brother, ah, a stronghold, lift of our head, our fortress. He's everything. Amen? And we will not lose a hold on him. No. We have to be stalkers of Jesus. That is our mission. To be stalkers of the Christ. Amen? Okay. So let's pray, beloved. Let's lift up the Lord in prayer. And lift up our brothers and sisters as we prepare to end this study. And learn from the mistakes of Israel. And pray for the, the eyes to the healing of Israel. Okay?
Heavenly Father God, we come in your awesome and most precious name, Jesus. And Father, we just thank you for salvation, for your grace, Lord God, for your blood that runs red for us, Lord God, your interceding blood, Father, your fire that goes before us, Lord God, your fire that surrounds us, Father. We thank you that your word is so powerful and so sharp and so just accurate, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that you are with us and you'll never leave us or forsake us. You're with us till the end of the age. We thank you, Father, that you are and you were and you'll forever be God, that you are deliverer of Israel and you are keeper of her, Father. We pray, Abba, Father, that you would open her eyes to see. Let the scales fall off her eyes, Lord God. And let her come to know you as the one true living God that she can never do in our lives, Father, for you. We pray that you'll come quickly, Lord Jesus. In this darkening world, that you would blaze it with fire. <laughs> that you would just burn evil to dust and put it under our feet. Thank you, Father. Put it under our feet that we could trample upon the enemy. Just as you've given us power every day in you. We pray, Abba, Father, that you'll teach us the things that we don't know. We don't confess to be wise, but fools, that we may be wise in your sight. That you may teach us more, teacher. You are a rabbi, and you are the wisest of the wise. You are Father, and only you. And we bless your holy name, and we lift it up in the mighty name of you, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen, beloved. The Lord is good, and he is good all the time. He's worthy to be praised in the assembly of the saints. Praise him, all ye the earth, who worship him in the beauty of holiness. He is worthy. He is worthy. We just finished our um, scripture off the prayer. Um, we've been going on for two weeks. This is a special thing for tribulation. Amen. Take in the servant. It's going to strengthen you, and it's going to equip you for this dark hour. In Jesus' name, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You all right? Where'd they go? Oh, they get quiet. <laughs> all right. All right. So when I get home, maybe um, I'll see what he gives and I'll give you what he gives as usual. Okay. So God bless you. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. This place is dark. It, it is not receiving Christ. There's a lot of Buddhism going on in this country, and there's a lot of Hinduism going on in this country. And you need to break that off your hand. And there's a lot of Islam in this country. Ah, people are rejecting Christ, but there are the one that's coming out of 300. The one that the Spirit of God is going to because they hear his voice and they come. So they're running after him. Amen? All right. I will see you when I get home. God bless you in Jesus' name. Jesus loves you, and I love you. Bye for now. <laughs>